Hey, everybody. It's good to see so many of you here this morning. This weather is absolutely amazing. Sometimes I tell myself I'm not going to make a comment about the weather. I just can't help it. I've almost forgotten about, mm, say, February. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris, for that uh, amazing song. Um, and Cindy, that meditation. Um, it's been a, a moving uh, morning already for me. What a great place uh, to be a part of. I feel really uh, grateful. And I was thinking about Mr. Rogers. I almost wish I, wish I had some like different shoes to put on right now. Because <laughs> I really, I, I hope whatever it is I say um, will be helpful in some respects. And I loved the combination of a helpful warrior. That's what I heard in that meditation. Sometimes a warrior can wear a cardigan. Don't forget that. So I want to open with reading again this poem by Adrian Rich. I want to read the whole thing. And in some respects, I, I'd like it to stand for whatever it stands for, regardless of what I have to say the next few minutes. It is a rich poem. I, I encourage you to read it sometime. It's, it's on the longer side uh, for her poems. Um, but just allow yourself to uh, deepen into the images here. The title of the poem and also the title of the teaching today is Diving Into the Wreck. Yeah, who would want to come to C3? Morning's topic, Diving Into the Wreck. <clears throat> but that um, seems like an invitation to me. First, having read the book of myths and loaded the camera, and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am having to do this not like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the sun-flooded schooner, but here alone. There is a ladder. The ladder is always there, hanging innocently close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it's a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down, she says, I go down. Rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me. The blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down. My flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down the ladder. And there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. First the air is blue, and then it is bluer, and then green, and then black. I am blacking out, and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. And now, it is easy to forget why I, what I came for. Among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crentilating fans between the reefs and besides, you breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevailed. 
I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. The thing I came for, the wreck, and not the story of the wreck. The thing I came for, the wreck, and not the story of the wreck. The thing itself, and not the myth. The drowned face always staring toward the sun. The evidence of damage, worn by salt and sway into the, this threadbare beauty. The ribs of disaster, the curving assertion among the tentative haunters. This is the place. And I am here. The mermaid whose dark hair streams black. The merman in his armored body. We silently circle about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she, I am he. Whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. We are the half destroyed instruments. We are the half destroyed instruments that once held to a course the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, we are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to this scene. Carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths in which our name See you next week. <laughs> I had to do my best not to read any literary criticism. I like literary criticism. Just because I always found this poem compelling, and I thought, I'm going to use this poem. And I thought, oh, no, I don't know what it means. <laughs> I need somebody else to tell me what it means. So I just resisted that temptation and tried to let the poem work on me, which I recommend doing. That's what a good poem does anyway. It works on you slowly over time. And that one line you thought, no, oh, that was kind of a dumb line. One day strikes you as, right, you cut you right to the heart. So what is this poem about? I don't exactly know. I just know by cowardice or courage, maybe a mixture of both, some of us, maybe all of us in one way, shape, or form have gone over the edge of our own boat down beneath the surface. It's a poem about going beneath the surface, for sure. It's a poem about how life Actually, much of life tends to be like this surface dwelling where we're just skimming along the top, hydro playing across our own lives. And yet, the whole time, there was a ladder that we sort of kept looking over until one day we realized we need it. And then rung by rung, we start climbing down. We don't have really much with us, except like a rubber suit that doesn't fit too well. We've got a knife, not sure what good that's going to do. We've got a camera because we don't want to forget and we have a book of myths that are telling us, go down. <laughs> and we, you know, slip beneath the surface. Um, so it's a poem about what's beneath the surface, and it's a poem about, it, about exploring our own wreckage, I think. The wreck at the bottom. And sort of returning to the scene of the wreck. And not just the story or the myth of the wreck, but the, myth, but the wreck itself. And what's down there? I think a mixture, like she says. There's something, there's some kind of gift. There's some kind of gold and silver and copper, but it's also inside half rotten barrels and a compass that's waterlogged. That's what the wreck looks like. It's a mixture. I think it's a poem about that. In some respects, it's a poem about wounds. 
ends a poem about gifts. One of the more disturbing things that Jung said, which I think she's sort of hints at a little bit here, is Jung says, hidden behind the wound is the gift. Hidden behind the wound is the gift. And you think, damn it, does that really have to be the case? And I think that's a little bit about this wreckage here. Down there, in the depths, not only is she learning to breathe in a way she's never learned to breathe, and I think the masculine and feminine are swirling around above the rib cage of the boat, but she's also beginning to discover the little bits of gold and silver that are down there in the wreckage. So I think it's a, um, a book about wounds and gifts, about wreckage and treasure, about myths, and also our own myth. One of the more disturbing sort of lines to me is how the poem ends. I'd love to go down the ladder armed with the book of myths that's going to tell me. Only at the very bottom I realize my name is not in any of these that I've been carrying around in this heavy and now waterlogged book. Which reminds me of something I put in the bulletin last week. And that's another line from Jung, which he said, I asked myself, what myth am I living? And I said, I don't know. And I thought, I better go find out about my myth. And I considered it the task of tasks. At a certain point, only you have the story that you're living. And myths and archetypes and metaphors and symbols only point you so far. Maybe just get you to the edge of the, the schooner where you get knocked off the side. Or you have to climb down in an awkward wetsuit. You ever tried running in a wetsuit? That's what it feels like, you know? All right. So that's the poem. So that's what I've been thinking about. And then I heard this story in NPR, which I thought was really awesome. I'm going to read you something. It's an obituary. Kathleen was born in 1938. She married and had two children. How oh, sweet. I'm adding that. Gina and Jay were their names. In 1962, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> she became pregnant by her husband's brother, Lyle, and moved to California. She abandoned her children, Gina and Jay, imagine who's writing this, who were raised by her parents. She passed away on May 31st in Springfield and will now face judgment. She will not be missed by Gina and Jay. <laughs> and they understand that this world is a better place without her. <laughs> There's something I find so interesting about this obituary. And actually it reminds me of this poem because you have your life Correct? You have your life. Like, like I said last week, James Hollis, you're the only recurring character in your story. You're in every scene. Right? You have your life. And then you have the story of your life. Correct? And then you have the stories that are told about your life. You're like three steps removed at this point. And, you know, what are your kids going to write about you in your obituary? And now they face judgment. <laughs> it's very interesting to me what's happening. Because like the poem said, that at least she's interested in diving into the wreck, not the story of the wreck. Not the myth of the wreck. Not the stories that are told, but the wreck itself. It's the alluring sort of thing at the bottom of the ocean in this poem. So we have our lives, and we have the story of our lives, and we have the story that other people tell about our lives. In other words, we have what happened, we have the facts, but then we have the question of what do those facts mean? That's part of what I mean by we're meaning-making creatures. We don't just regurgitate facts. 
How boring would the obituary be if it was just facts? But as soon as it jumps into interpretation of those facts and the story of those facts, suddenly something about it, we're in the meaning-making business. We're hunting for meaning. And actually, I read this and I think, now what's true? Right? What is really true? Because when you read the boring ones, it's like so-and-so passed away and they're survived by so-and-so and so-and-so and and they were really successful and everything was great. You know, I'm thinking, come on, this cannot be. What's the story? So I was reading an article in The Atlantic and um, that David Dean sent me. And, and it's, uh, the title of it, I wrote it down here somewhere, The Story of My Life, How Narrative Creates Personality. That's the title of the article if you're interested. You can look it up and find it online. And um, one of the things I thought was intriguing about the article, first of all, we all sort of are born into the world and there's a certain narrative about the way life should go that's kind of placed on us. And a lot of that has to do with social class and ethnicity, where you're born in the world, so geography, all these are layers of the story that gets placed on you. One of the things the article's poking around in is sort of a kind of an American, largely white American sort of narrative that's placed upon people. And very simply, it goes something like, you go to school, because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, You're supposed to graduate. You're supposed to get a job. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to have kids, and you're supposed to retire. There's your general scope. Okay? And problems begin to arise. I put problems in quotation marks when the narrative doesn't exactly line up. It's a very redemption-oriented um narrative, according to to the article. Um, And what we love more than anything else is the self, usually made man, the self-made man or the self-made woman, um, but largely the image historically has been the man, person who goes through these things on their own, accomplishes, defeats all odds, so forth and so on. That's kind of what the article is saying is behind some of this uh, stuff. Um, But that doesn't often line up. The narrative doesn't often unfold the way it's supposed to unfold. And you can either begin to grow up at that point and begin some, the process of rewriting, what is my life? Or you can spend your time in compl- complicity and sort of trying to align back up to the way things are supposed to go. And one, what, are the articles, what the article is saying is that a sign of maturity often looks like two tensions bumping into one another. Would you like to know what they are? The tensions are agency, like autonomy, agency, or to use depth psychology, individuation. Taking responsibility would say agency. I am the captain of my fate would be the exaggerated version of that. Bumps into and is in tension with communion. Actually, I am deeply interconnected in this web of which I don't actually have that much control. Maturity looks like tension between those two things. Immaturity looks like one or the other. Total agency, I make my own choices, I'm in charge of my life. Or total communion, there's nothing I can do. It's a bit fatalistic. I'm completely dependent, down to a kind of infantilizing, someone else should take care of me. Those are like sort of two extremes. Maturity looks like growing into uh, the tension of agency and communion. So it's just something I think that's worth filing away. When you start talking about what is my life and what is the story of my life? How do I talk about the story of my life? How do I find meaning in my life? Where are the tensions between agency and communion? Because really any good story, really any honest good story Looks like a little of both. I made this choice at a very difficult time in my life. I did it. No one else helped me make this choice. And all of a sudden, somebody came along and supported such a thing. Or the other way around. I was being supported by someone or some situation. And then all of a sudden, I found within me the freedom and the capacity to make a very difficult choice. Do you see how those? that seems like a more honest way of reading your own life? So this got me thinking about the story 
and the wreck itself. This tension, the story, the way we talk about it, and the wreck itself. And I started thinking about our scripts. Now, any of you been to therapy, which is probably all of you, um, probably your therapist brought up scripts at a certain point. Maybe, depending on your therapist, maybe sub-personalities or complexes, other ways of sort of naming these energies that um, are usually learned in early childhood that take over, especially under duress or stress of some sort. Um, and I started thinking about these scripts because the scripts are pretty powerful stories. Do you know what I mean when I say script? The script that's running your life can be a pretty powerful story and it can take over. So let's just uh, list some examples of some scripts. Here's a good script. I'm an unlucky person. Okay. I'm the kind of person who goes to the car dealership and has saved up for a new Jetta. I don't know. <laughs> I get the thing home or it's used. Let's, let's go used. Get the thing home. And the next morning I go out and it won't start. You know? And so um, I call a tow truck and um, while the tow truck is there, um, I forget to put it, the parking brake on and it rolls back and it knocks over the fire hydrant. The fire hydrant goes off and floods my basement. Therefore, the story is I'm an unlucky person. And this always happens to me. This stuff always happens to me. See, the narrative, once the script gets activated, that's the way you explain the situation. This stuff always happens to me. And sometimes it becomes a little self-fulfilling prophecy. You actually don't want someone coming along and saying, now let's talk about where you had some agency in any of this and where you didn't have agency, where there was communion, where there was agency. We don't want to talk about that. We'll just, we prefer the script of I'm an unlucky person. And actually, people then feel bad for you. They're like, oh yeah, totally unlucky. That's a kind of script. Here's a script. I'm not smart. I remember I was leading a, a trip to Israel, which I occasionally do, and there was someone on the trip um, who asked me a question, and, and my sort of intuition was, this person is far more perceptive than most of the people on the trip. And that's a bit of a judgment on my part, but that was my sort of, I was like, this person is perceiving something beneath what I'm trying to say. And actually, is perceiving something that's going on in the history and culture, but doesn't yet have words for it. And I heard her say, well, I'm not, a smart, I'm not smart like you, therefore blah, 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 blah. And I thought, okay, definitely the script is being activated because my experience is that in, on one level, you're far smarter, what I mean by now, just now, is perceptive about what's really going on, but somehow in your whatever past, you got the script of you're not smart. You can't understand in the, the way other people can understand. I got a, a script that's pers personal. I'm not good at math. How do I know that? Because I was not good at math. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't do math. That's what I thought. Like something about it uh, didn't register. Like I, I would look at a problem and it's like it meant nothing. Like, the, it, didn't, it didn't symbolize anything to me. I know it symbolizes something, but it's like nothing about it, I would just, it would just be blank when I saw a problem. So the script, now this goes back to the second grade probably for me, but the script is, I can't do math. Now, whether that's true or not, take some investigation. Now, this script worked its way into my life in such a profound way that every single year around... April 15, I would break into sheer panic because I'm not good at math. I can't do math. I don't understand how it works. I can't understand the taxes. So I have to have somebody else come along and take care of all this for me. And I would go with great shame, which I would all be shoving down, and hand over all my things. This is what I made, and here's my W-9, and here's this, and now tell me what I owe the government. And it was a very shaming experience, if I'm very honest about it. I'm making light of it, but it really was. And I started thinking about this, you know, a few years ago, and I thought, really? And I made a commitment, I'm going to do my own taxes. And I'm not kidding you, I was terrified. Utterly terrified. Mostly because every time I heard that word, my script was activated. I can't do this. 
I'm not good at math. My second grade teeter, teacher is going to scold me. I'm going to have to cheat to get my way through college. By the way, I graduated college. I was an English major, obviously not a math major. And I had to take the lowest, I tried to avoid all math for four years. And in order to graduate my senior year, I had to take a math class. And I took the math class, and I remember in the exam knowing I failed. I, I just, something deep in my bones, I, I, I knew I, I didn't pass the math class. And I got the grade back, I was like, huh, I passed. I was like, there's, I wonder how I passed. And it took me a while to figure this out, but it turns out that my professor <laughs> was not very good at statistics. <laughs> Wait a minute. At the University of Virginia, where my dad went, and my dad, who was very good at statistics, helped him pass the class. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's how I magically passed my math class. I'll never know. I'll just remain in the mystery. I never asked. But in any case, these are scripts. And I think one of the things we're asked to do, sort of diving into the wreck, is begin to examine these. And these are light ones, but there can be far more powerful ones. I'll, I'll list the big ones that tend to get activated. Like, I'm a failure. Like, I'm a wounded child. I'm a rebel. That's a very big script that can get activated. And you end up just rebelling and rebelling and rebelling and rebelling and rebelling. And the man can't tell me what to do. And some, but something else is going on at a certain point. Or the, even the victim. The victim is a major script. It doesn't mean that something didn't happen or things happen to real people that caused real suffering. But what happens later is the script gets activated. And you begin to over-identify and talk about the story that then you tell about your life is only run through this single grid. I am the rebel and the victim. I'm the wounded one here. I'm unloved. I'm a rescuer. I'm not good at math, so forth and so on. These stories can run your life. You end up repeating yourself to death. The other day I was at a party and I heard a, a friend of mine tell a story. And I was like, man, that is a hilarious story. He's like, where have I heard that before? I was like, oh, I've heard him tell that story before which is a giant mirror. I repeat myself all the time. I probably already repeated several stories in public standing on this thing. We'll see. Um, but why is it that we repeat the stories in the same way we tell the stories, hoping for a similar kind of reaction? Sometimes it's just the script getting activated. If I don't tell this one funny story, or if I don't refer to myself in this particular way, I won't know who I am. It's at that moment that a ladder appears on the schooner of your life. And you think, I wonder what would happen if I put on my flippers and I got my knife and I consulted a few myths and rung by rung, I went down and consulted the wreck again. Would I emerge telling the story the way I've always told the story? Or would something need to be rewritten? That's the question I'm asking. At the end of this Atlantic article, I said this to some of you um, in the follow-up or in the talkback time. The very last line of this article is that uh, your, your story is written in chalk, which is like a lovely metaphor. You can read chalk. It matters. I love chalk. When I was a school teacher, I, like, I had a chalkboard when I first started uh, teaching high school, and they wanted to replace it with whiteboards. I'm like, please, no, don't do it. Chalk is such a beautiful thing. You can read it, but it, you can also erase it. <laughs> you can also move the words around. You can also have drafts or versions. Your life is written in chalk. See, the problem with scripts is not that you have scripts. Everybody has scripts. Everybody. It's a survival mechanism. How else can you survive other than the scripts that you get? When you're a kid... Like, like Gina and Jay here, and they were abandoned by their mother. That really happened. That really was a tragedy. It was a trauma that cut so deep, they have to write about it when she dies. So that really happened. And also, something 
of a script started forming. Now, we'd have to separate them and find out the scripts because I bet they're not exactly the same. Same wound experienced two slightly different ways, I bet, correct? And what happens now later in life as that script begins to get activated? I am the one who gets abandoned. I'm the one who gets abandoned. I'm the one who gets abandoned. That's the invitation to dive back down into the wreck. And remember, here's the creepy promise by Carl Jung. I bet no one said that sentence before. (laughs) Hidden behind the wound is a gift. But if you don't dive into the wreck, you never find it. You don't. You don't know what's down there. So poor Gina and Jay, I'd say, yeah, that was a nice little stab at mom, but don't forget there's a ladder on the side of the schooner. Will you go down? Will you not go down? Become the kind of questions I might want to ask. The problem with scripts is that you hand the meaning over to somebody else. You do. You hand the story of your own life and the meaning of it to somebody else. This person did this to me. My second grade teacher never taught me math. I hand the meaning of my life over to somebody else. Which makes for a small life. So the harsh truth is, and probably your therapist told you this at some point, but the harsh truth is that stuff happened to you. Really, stuff happened to you. It did. And you did stuff right? You did stuff. And you're not just what happened to you. Correct? You're not just what happened to you. You're not just the things that you did or said that you're not proud of. You're not just that. That somewhere in the rotten barrel is some silver and some copper and some gold. That's true hidden behind the wound is the gift. This is what I call a kind of like wound paradox. You were wounded in the way that you were wounded. I was thinking about Gina and Jay. What's what's their names? I keep referring to them as like I know them. Good old Gina and Jay. That's it, Gina and Jay. Um, I was thinking about them, and I was thinking about how they, like, I started to wonder, how did they experience the wound of abandonment? Because they were definitely abandoned. How did they experience that? And this week, I heard a Japanese proverb from Michael Mead, uh, the storyteller, and the proverb goes something like this. Um, There is a, a hole waiting for the boar's tusk. There is a hole in you waiting for the boar's tusk. Yeah, exactly. Huh. (laughs) It means, I think, you're shaped in a certain way. And and you're going to experience the wounds of life in the way you're going to experience them. It almost doesn't matter who does it to you. You're shaped in the way that you're shaped. And there will be a boar, whether it's Kathleen, who fell in love with Lyle, and had a baby and moved to California, the way Gina and Jay experienced that wound, they were shaped in a certain way, and then the boar's tusk penetrated the gaping hole. And that's worth investigating. In what way was I shaped? It makes it less personal. That's what that Japanese proverb is saying. You're going to be wounded in the way you're going to be wounded. And it almost doesn't matter who, it, who does it to you. That's not exactly great news. <laughs> it's sobering news. Okay, yeah. All right, everybody has these capacities. And I'm going to be wounded in the way I'm going to be wounded. And the question is, am I going to dive into the wreck? Because the promise is, there's something gold down there. And you actually know this in a a less dramatic way. When you're drawn, when you empathize with someone or some situation, and it kind of surprises you, probably it's because you've been wounded in a similar way. I always think about that with social justice. Why is so-and-so so so fired up about this cause and this other person could care less? My question is, how have they been wounded? And how is that, that energy 
for change, how is that being activated? And what's the gift on the flip side? Part of the gift is just being able to see. Ah, this person's hurt over here. I can see this and other people can. Probably because you experienced something similar yourself. So, all right. How do I want to yeah, how do I want to wind this down? Richard Rohr, uh, Franciscan, likes to say, if you don't transform your pain, you will transmit it. If you don't transform your pain, or you can make it more general. If your pain is not transformed, you'll transmit it. That doesn't, um, in no way, in no way am I saying, I'm glad you were wounded in the way you were wounded. No one celebrates heartache, trauma, suffering, and wounds like that. All I think Rohr is trying to say is that something about that can either be transformed or it can be passed on. And what often happens is we're really good at transmitting <laughs> and passing on down the line. So back to Gina and Jay, I'm going to pick on them. If this is their major script, and it's so powerful that they're going to write it in the obituary, I wonder in what, in what ways they're going to transmit. The same kinds, not in the same circumstances, but the, the capacity to transmit that kind of abandonment. That's what's at stake. And just because... Mom's now in the grave doesn't mean it's over. I remember when my dad died, my therapist said, all right, so he's in the grave. That doesn't mean he's gone from a psychic point of view. Correct? Yeah. So, all right, here's how I'll end. Um, our names, after all, that's how the poem ends. Our names, uh, our true names do not appear in myths not in other people's myths. Or in other people's stories, for that matter. Or in personalities that we worship or deride. Our names don't appear. They're not over there. They're not in some other person. Our names actually do not appear in obituaries. Our true names, they don't. There are facts there that refer generally to your true name. But they don't appear actually in obituaries written by other people. Our names do not appear in personality tests. I like them. They're fun. Myers-Briggs, INTJ, fine. What's that mean? Who cares? On one level, really, who cares? Because the kind of name that she's talking about here, which I or I, my other language would be soul, doesn't appear in a personality test. You are not four letters. It's true. That's just a statistical average. And would you want to go around saying, I'm a statistical average? Come on. And I don't understand statistics, by the way. Because I'm bad at math. Or if you're into the Enneagram, the Enneagram, you are not a number. You are not a number. There might be some energies in which a certain number might represent, but you are not a number. It's impossible. How will you find out? You'll have to dive down into the wreck. And on the way down, the ladders might be things like, oh, there's my Myers-Briggs number. Now I'm going deeper. There's my Enneagram number. Oh, time to go further. All right? That's what it's like. Our names, after all, are a mystery. The mystery of who you are is the mystery of who you are. Our life is a mystery. Somewhere maybe between communion and agency, like we were talking before, about will and surrender at the same time. Our names appear when our wounds do not have the final say. Our names appear when our wounds do not have the final say. Your wounds matter. I'm not minimizing them. But they don't have the final say. That's the gold in flex coming forth. To bring that forth in the world. That's to discover the kind of name I think she's alluding to here in the poem. So I guess my hope is that 
you can find courage, maybe for some of you again, if need be, to visit the ladder. You might need to visit the ladder. You might not. You might have done the wreckage diving, the deep diving, and now you're returning. And it's time to live that name, that no name (laughs) and no name you've ever been called can really represent. What, what I think Jung would, means by your personal myth that you bring out of the depths and live forth in the world. So I guess in some respects, I hope you have the courage to either do some deep diving or return with your little golden flex, return from the scene and rewrite and retell. Because maybe there's something about your own story that really matters and has to be retold. The, the chalk has to be erased and you have to reorder some things. I remember um, I don't do a lot of um, book-related events. I had a book come out almost a year, year ago now. And um, I was, uh, every once in a while when I do do a book event, what ends up is that people quote from the book back to me and then they ask me what I meant by that, which is kind of funny. That's why I wrote a book. <laughs> um, but the funny thing about that experience is so when people quote me to myself, sometimes they think, hey, that's true. Which is like, oh, it's like a good thought. Like, yeah, that seems about right. And sometimes I think I wouldn't say that. Even though I wrote that, I wouldn't say that now. That's the chalk. Yeah. So either, if I'm still talking about being bitten by a camel in five years, you'll know I'm stuck. Now it's a script. Now I'm just repeating myself to death. I'm the guy that was bitten by a camel and this is what it means. No, it's written in chalk. And I think to go over the edge of the schooner is to begin the process of rewriting. Because the world needs you. The world needs your story. The world needs your name. Not what other people will say about you. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to the scene. Carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths in which our names do not appear. Thanks for listening.